Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hitting growth opportunities throughout online business. For those familiar new to the podcast, I'm Sarah and thanks for joining me today. In this episode, we're joined by Gianmarco Mele, Managing Director at Merch Hub and the founder and host of the Seller Process Podcast, a show that focuses on the best ways to automate e-commerce businesses through the use of SOPs, systems, and processes. Today, Marco explains how SOPs help FBA and e-commerce entrepreneurs break out of plateaus and optimize their business efficiency. He gives us a step-by-step breakdown of how to create a tailor-made SOP and how to apply SOPs to the different aspects of your business to maximize productivity. Gianmarco also has given a special gift to everyone listening, an ebook guide on how to systemize your Amazon FBA business through the use of SOPs. Head on over to the show notes to find a link for the ebook. If poorly optimized processes have been holding your business back from reaching its true potential, then this episode could be the game changer you've been waiting for. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. Really excited to have today's guest on, Gianmarco Mele. So Gianmarco, how you doing? Hey Sarah, I'm great. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. Just curious, where are you calling in from in the world? I'm currently in the best part of Italy, you know, the south of Italy, Sicily, where food is great. There's always sun here, beaches are great. Yeah, so I'm having fun here. Awesome. Yeah, I love that you delineate. It's like, yeah, it's the best part of Italy. I don't blame you on that front. I haven't been to Sicily yet. Super high on my list. I would love to go and visit for all those reasons that you just said. Super cool. So Gianmarco, we got to talk a little bit offline, but for those who don't know you, wanted to dig into your backstory because you have been described or self-described as a serial entrepreneur. You created your first startup at the age of 24. That's awesome. Can you walk me through how you made your way into the world of online business? For sure. Yeah. So as I said, I was born and raised in Italy, but basically I spent most of my working life in Shanghai, China, where basically I moved after the university. And I started as an intern in a company. And then a year and a half later, I started my own startup and I hired my first intern. So that was kind of a fun experience. But, you know, in that first startup, I did all the mistakes that you can find in any typical blog titled the most common mistakes of startup founders. I've done them all, all the mistakes (laughs) in the book. And so it was a great experience. Basically, you know, as an Italian, I love food. I have used to great food and I didn't find the same in China. So basically what I started doing was to buy from importers, like food at a bulk discount. I was doing some kind of group buying together with friends to get best prices on imported food because, you know, local food, it was not my favorite, although it is still good Chinese food, but I was buying like imported food from suppliers. So then I turned that into my first startup, which was doing basically group buying on imported food products. It's a big category, actually, imported foods in China because local people don't trust their own food because of past uh, scandals. So people love to buy like French food, Italian food, also American food, and so on. So my first startup was like that. We created our own platform based on WeChat, which is the most common social platform in China. And we created a store there. I joined forces with Chinese partner and we created this first e-commerce store that was basically putting together a lot of people in order to reach a certain number. And then we were buying products from these importers at great discounts. So I joined an accelerator program, you know, backed by a VC. So they invested in us and We lived, you know, like a startup life for a couple of years, and then we didn't manage to make more, to raise more money. 
And I kind of ended up there. Then I started my Amazon business and I preferred to, to focus more on Amazon instead of that startup. But definitely was a great experience. And that's how I started my career, let's say, into e-commerce. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you weren't messing around when you're saying, I'm really into food. <laughs> I love that you brought over those imported goods to China and you were basically solving your own problem and a problem for other people. I got fixated on something you said earlier when you were talking about having your own startup and making all of your own mistakes. And then obviously you landed eventually into the world of Amazon. And I was wondering, you know, as you had found your footing as an entrepreneur, I think, you know, somewhere along the way, at least my take from the outside, it sounds like you were very passionate about, say, finding systems and processes and things that help to make your life easier as an entrepreneur and doing so through the lens of SOPs. I mean, I'm wondering, how did you kind of find out that, okay, it's the systems, processes, and SOPs that are really going to make my life easier? And maybe just for those who don't know what an SOP is, would you briefly explain what an SOPs are? Yeah, sure. So, you know, SOP stands for Standard Operating Procedures. It sounds like something complex, but it really is just the way you do things. It can be either written down or in a video forms. And that's basically, you know, the model or the, you can also say the easiest path or the most efficient way to perform a specific task, okay? So everyone who is operating a business is doing certain tasks, right? So those tasks have steps, you know, you do something and then there are several steps on each process. It's just that you have that process in your mind. It's not written down or documented in any way. So an SOP is simply putting down in a written form or on video, a process that you're already doing, you know, the way you are performing a task. So that's really something very simple. Everyone can start with, and it will improve the efficiency of your business in so many ways that now, I mean, we can dig deeper into, but that's essentially what an SOP is. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you setting that up. Circling back to your time in Amazon, I was wondering, what are the advantages specifically for Amazon sellers to have clear SOPs in place? Yeah, so, you know, one of the main thing is that when you put down in a written form the process that you use in order to perform a task, you're basically helping yourself to streamline a complex process because, you know, you're currently doing things is not necessarily the best way to do that thing, okay? But if you have it in your mind, it's going to be really hard, especially if there are several steps and it's a complex process, like, for example, managing PPC or doing keyword research. These are like very complex processes that it's very difficult to bear all of the steps in your mind at once. So if you put them down, you're basically creating a system to improve each of those steps because you write them down so then you can go line by line and understand which part of the system can be improved or can be eliminated at all, you know, or can be optimized. So that's one of the benefits, you know, streamlining complex processes. And then another benefit is that there is actually a misbelief that people think that standardizing things, which is what SOPs do, like heals creativity because, you know, you keep doing the way the things in the same way. So you're kind of killing creativity. You don't give space for changing things. But actually, that's really a misbelief. That's not true at all. Because uh, what SOPs do is to free up your mental energy. You know, when you do all of those tedious tasks every time, you know, the same way, for example, you know, setting up products or doing some PPC optimization, let's say, by following always the same procedure, you're freeing up your mental energy because this time you don't have to anymore like think every step through all the way, you know, you don't have to think every single thing that you're doing, but instead you can follow, for example, a simple checklist. So that way you're freeing up your mind and you can spend that mental energy that you saved into more creative tasks. So I would say really SOPs helps with uh, creativity because then you are freeing up mental energy on those tedious tasks so that you can focus that mental energy on creative tasks. And the last benefit I would say, which is one that I really enjoy, is that you will save a lot of time for future new team onboarding. 
you know, when you have the several systems and processes written down or in videos and in your database, these are basically the trainings for your new team members. So for example, now, you know, every time I have to hire a new person in my team, you know, I simply have like the onboarding conversation, which I give them the access to all the SOPs and they just go there and train themselves. You know, this is a huge time saving for those who have team members will definitely agree that, you know, every time you onboard somebody, it's a pain, you know, to explain them everything. But if you have all the SOPs already written down there, you just give them the access and you say, go read or watch these SOPs and then start doing your job. So these three are really some of the main advantages, but there are many more. Okay. And I'm sure that we'll get into more of them during the podcast. I thought your point about the fact that they enable and not inhibit creativity was a really interesting one. You know, it makes me think of my next question because it's that feels like an excuse. Like I'm sure you talk to people or talk to Amazon sellers who are like, hey, I'm not trying to SOP the hell out of my business because too much structure means I can't do what I want to do or, you know, new ideas won't come up. And obviously you made a good point as to why that is not the case. But when I hear that, I think, okay, that's a seller standing in their own way. That's them being their worst enemy. And so I was wondering if that resonates with you. Do you see ways that sellers kind of get in their own way, their own worst enemy when it comes to efficiency in their Amazon businesses? Well, absolutely. And that's something, you know, all the entrepreneurs need to make a mindset shift. You know, usually most of entrepreneurs, you know, because they are entrepreneurs, you know, they believe they're awesome. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> kind of a common trait of most entrepreneurs. And, you know, they really are, but you cannot be good at everything. Okay. So, you know, you become your own bottleneck on all those tasks that you are not great at. You, maybe you're good or you're just okay at it, but you cannot really be great at everything. Right. So all the entrepreneurs need to have a mindset shift. You know, the real job of an entrepreneur is not to do the job, but to create jobs. Okay. So that's the real role of an entrepreneur. So let's not steal the work from our like VAs, you know, they can do it or team members can do everything basically that we're doing. And that's also actually another misbelief that people think that they can only do that kind of task. They can only do product research. They are the only one who can do PPC management. That's not true. You know, the same way you learn something, anyone else can learn. So really, we need to start working on this mindset shift in which, you know, we start to be people who create jobs and not the one who do the job. And that's going to lead, you know, to a totally big change in your company if you start thinking that way. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I love how you just lined out kind of all the different potential avenues in which, you know, we can stand in our own ways and not even realize that we're hurting the business, that we're taking stuff away from our VAs that they could be doing, et cetera. I guess in the same vein, if we're talking about ways that people get stuck, I was wondering where do most sellers get stuck when it comes to scaling their FBA businesses? And is there a way that SOPs could come in and help them break out of a plateau? Yeah, for sure. You know, actually, if you talk with any CEO of a company that's, let's say, bigger than one or two million dollars in revenue, you will not find no CEO that doesn't have already SOPs implemented in their business. That's because it's basically impossible to scale a business without proper systems in place. Okay. So what happened is that you know, maybe Amazon, they start selling more, they add product, they try to scale their business. And at the same time, they also scale complexity. Okay, so they keep adding more products, more channels, more marketplaces, more of everything. And they will soon realize that if they don't have a proper system to manage all those parts, the whole business will break apart. So that's really like basic fundamental skills of managing a company is to create SOPs that basically create consistency in your business so that every time you do a certain task, then it will happen, you know, the same result. Okay. So, you know, the way the SOPs help them 
break that plateau. It's just, you know, giving order to the business, making order where there was chaos, because maybe sometimes people just start without caring much about SOPs and putting down their systems, but then they will soon realize that it will be impossible to manage a certain structure once it's growing. So it's kind of a natural path, you know, like when you start growing your business, then you must focus also on implementing SOPs and creating systems for your business. That's a fantastic point. Some of the things that you just said, I'd like to follow up on a bit more in in later questions, especially when it comes to team and implementing SOPs to bring order to the chaos, as you said. But I want to start from square one and talk about, let's go through beginning steps. So for Amazon sellers who are new to the game, what does the process of writing SOPs from scratch actually look like? Well, yeah, so most people see that as an intimidating task, you know, because they think they have to put a lot of work and write down everything they're doing. But actually, that's not how it works. Usually, the metaphor, let's say, or the story that I use to explain this is the one of the hare and the turtle, right? So, you know, the moral of that story is that steady and slow win the race, right? So that's how you should approach SOPs creation and systems creation in your business. So what you should do is that to schedule a little bit of time every week. And when you are doing that task, so at the same time that you're doing that task, you start recording the screen or putting it up like a Word file or a spreadsheet and then writing down what you are actually doing, the steps that you are taking. So, you know, I would say you know, a quick experiment that I suggest people doing is that, you know, after you will finish to listen this, just, you know, see what's in your to-do list and let's say it's a uh, keyword research, okay? So you have in your to-do list that you need to do the keyword research for a certain product. Okay, great. So take like a screen recorder. There are so many like, for example, loom.com or screencast-o-matic. We can put it maybe in the show notes, some links. But anyway, there are so many screen recorders. And just, you know, like a hit record and then just do whatever you were supposed to do, but commenting that out loud in the same time. And that's going to be, for example, your first SOP. Maybe it's not going to be the best one, but you know, you've just created your first SOP. It's a video explaining how you do keyword research. And that's it. That could be your first step. And then you can implement like more complex ways to structure that SOP, which maybe we can talk about today. But that's essentially, you know, the first step that everybody can take. Yeah, I guess to build off of that, I mean, you had reviewed some of your materials and you talked about that there's different kinds of SOPs that sellers should have. Is that kind of what you're getting into when you're talking about building them out and making them more complex and maybe even building a system of different kinds of SOPs? What would that look like? Yeah, so it can be, yes. You know, you can use like a more in-depth structure to create and put down and collect your SOPs. But essentially, yeah, there are several ways to create an SOP. For example, one of them, you know, could be like checklists. That's an easy way to start. For example, you know, when you create a new product, there are several things that you should do. Like, for example, you know, upload the images, upload the text, you know, the bullet point, the title and so on, or create, for example, a PPC launch campaign and so on. So there are different things that you should do every time that you are setting up a new product or launching a new product. So a checklist might be a good friend of yours because it will help you remember all the steps that you should take. And then you tick them off as you actually do those things. So checklists are one easy way that people can start with. Also, another way, for example, is that let's say you think you are stuck in your product development process. Okay, so you're thinking that maybe you are not going as fast as you should in terms of creating new products. Okay, great. So that's the time, for example, create a process map. So that's like a high view of the overall process of product development. So it starts, for example, from generating ideas, then validating those ideas, and then reaching out to suppliers, getting quotes, getting samples, and then reevaluate everything and make an order and so on. Okay. So if you write this down into a process map, so like all these points that I mentioned would be, for 
example, like a box into this flow chart, into this map that we call process map. And then you go evaluating each of the steps. Like, let's say, let's dig deeper into generating product ideas. Is there anything wrong there that I'm you know, spending too much time on? Or maybe is it, I don't know, the supplier research that is taking the most of my time? So what can I improve on that specific point? So that's how you should go about in using SOPs, you know, there are different kinds. Another one I can mention, it's, for example, like flowcharts. Flowcharts are very useful whenever there are those types of processes that have uh, multiple possible outcomes. So if something happened, do this. If something else happened, then do that. For example, a good use of this type of SOP can be PPC optimization. So for example, if the keyword has more than X clicks, do this. If the keyword has more than this X ACOS, then do that, for example, you know. So this will help you to create a map, you know, a workflow that you can always refer to whenever you are doing PPC optimization. So these three, for example, are good examples of SOPs that people can start implementing in their business in a very easy way. Of the ones that you just mentioned, do you have either, you know, a personal favorite or one that you think moves the needle the most for sellers? Let's say doing your work as a CEO, let's say like a high level strategic work, I think process maps are great because it gives you like a high view of the process so that you can start managing each of that step and improving that step. But then, you know, checklists are actually something like very, very powerful. You know, these are used by airplane pilots all the time. That's really just now, like in 2021, they are still using it since decades. So they just work. You know, if you have a list of things that you need to do in order not to forget what you have to do, you just create checklists. They work perfectly and it's kind of an old style thing, but they still work today. So we really don't need to have very complex things, you know, checklists, flowcharts are all great ways to represent your processes. And, you know, they don't take much effort to create. You don't need any expensive software to create them. Just words like Word or Google Docs, that's enough. Or a Canva. That's a great point because you said about it doesn't have to be complex. I'm sure I think everyone always believes that it's like, oh, I don't need SOPs. I'll have a project management system. I'll get this complex system that'll do all those things for me. And at the end of the day, it's sometimes those simple things. It's those checklists, like you were saying, that they've worked for many industries for a long time for a reason. And you know, don't overcomplicate your own process. Just get in there, outline it, make sure it's clear, and then you can go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, listening to this and one thing you said earlier, SOPs are there for quelling the chaos and they help streamline workflow processes and inventory management, all of that. But I mean, I'm curious, where do SOPs fit into, say, Amazon brand building? Well, yeah, so that's a very good question. And, you know, I would rephrase a little bit this, you know, in order to give like a better perspective, is not really much about where SOPs fit into brand building, but mostly in general, where they fit in any brand or any business in general. Because, you know, we're not talking about the latest trick here. It's not like, hey guys, try these things, SOPs, you know, they work great. Like the same way you would do with, you know, the latest external traffic kind of trick or, you know, like chatbots, you know, guys, try this new chatbot, it's working great. No, here we're talking about business fundamentals, okay? It's not related just to Amazon brands or even to Amazon in general. You will see uh, CEOs implementing SOPs and systems in every business existing in every industry, okay? So this is a mindset, another mindset shift that people should have because, yeah, here we're not talking about a new thing or a trick that they should implement. You know, this is like a fundamental part, you know, is the basic structure of their business. It's where the business is based on. So we're not talking about whether you should implement SOPs or not, but when you are going to do it. Okay, so it fits in every business as the fundamental part to build up everything else, I would say. Yeah, I like that perspective and that reshifting the question. I think it's 
absolutely worth mentioning. You know, in light of everything that you've laid out and all the different potential with SOPs, can you talk to me about any real world examples you have, the impact you've witnessed with SOPs, whether that's on a business's ROI or their ability to scale? Is that something that you've seen? Yeah, yeah, definitely, for sure. So, you know, again, here, if we're talking about ROI, you know, we're talking about return on investment. And in this investment, you know, we should include our time because time is the most important thing, actually, that we're investing. So maybe we can even call it as a return on time because SOPs, what they're going to do is to save you a lot of time. You know, they're going to have a great impact on your time. And a real example that I always, you know, like to mention because it really has a lot of impact in my own business that whenever you hire a new person, if you have done the work before hiring that person, like you have really written down all these SOPs and recorded all those videos, then this shift, you know, of roles, you know, whenever you're going to give the tasks to this new person, it's going to be like very seamless transition. Okay. It's going to go very smoothly. But if you don't have anything to give to these new people, it's going to be like an endless back and forth between you and this person asking you for everything. And that's going to be a nightmare. And you're going to hate the fact that you hired somebody. And you probably will start to have this kind of feeling that hiring people is not good. You know, everybody says to create your own team in podcasts and hire your VAs, but it's not working for me, which is not true. You know, every company, you know, if when it's time to scale, they must have help and support from team members can be VAs, can be full-time team members, can be just freelancers, but that's really key to scale the business. So it's going to make you, you know, the whole experience of hiring a person much better. And you're going to realize that's really the way to do things to create order in your business. So from this point on, you know, when you have these SOPs in place, every time the person is going to ask you something that is not including the SOPs, you go like, great. So you are in charge of this SOP. Please update the SOPs that includes now the answer to the question that you just asked me. So then, you know, over time, you are going to create like a massive database of everything that you are doing. And that's going to be done not really by you, but from your team members, you know, by your team members. So at some point, you're going to hand over also the SOP creation task. So they are going to create SOPs for you. And that's just going to be, you know, the starting point to scale your business even further. Okay, so that's really one of the best like, real world example that I can come up with because that's what I've experienced also in my own business. Yeah, it's great advice. You team me up for my next question because I wanted to talk to you about the best practices to implement SOPs for yourself as a seller and your team. Because like you said, people say, oh, go out and hire. And then, well, we figure out hiring doesn't solve all your problems because you have to train those people. You have to make them work into your system. So I love that piece of advice you gave, You know, making sure you're passing the torch on to other people in your company to update those SOPs and be guardians of them. Did you have anything else in terms of best practices for implementing the SOPs across teams or even for sellers, you know, for sellers to not get in their own way? Yeah, sure. So I can name a few. So first one would be make sure to assign only one responsible person for each SOP. You need to take that person accountable for updating that SOP. That's crucial because you don't want overlaps between in roles. Okay. So if you're handing over the process of, for example, doing PPC optimization or doing keyword research or creating shipping plans. Okay. So from that point on, that person is the main responsible person for that SOP. So they are responsible to keep it updated. Okay. And they are responsible also to make sure that it is actually the best way to perform that task, you know, because they might come up with better ways that spend less time, less energy and less effort. Okay. So that's uh, one point. Then another point is you should, you have to have like a very thought out way to number SOPs. And I can suggest the way I'm doing because, you know, at some point you will have lots of SOPs. You might come up after several months with, I don't know, 60, 80 SOPs, maybe 
hundred. So in order to find them, it's going to be really difficult at some point. And you need to number them properly. The same way as people suggest, for example, to name the PPC campaigns properly, because then it's going to be easier to manage them. That's the same way, the same idea. So you need to number the SOPs like for example, starting with a department number. So I give like an eight department structure. So every business it's divided in eight departments, for example, like inventory and logistics, marketing and ads, creative production, product development, customer service, finance and admin, general operations, and then the website, like your out of Amazon processes. So first of all, put the SOP in the right department, okay? And that's gonna be like the structure of your folders, for example, in your cloud storage, like Drive or Dropbox, okay? So you're gonna have one folder for each of these department. And then in each department, there's gonna be the SOP with its own number, okay? And then each SOP will have several steps and each of those steps is going to have its own number as well. So this way you are go really deep into finding and improving each single step. So to give you a, a real example, let's say creating the shipping plan, it's an SOP, right? So let's say that's the first SOP of your department inventory and logistics, okay? So that's gonna be, SOP 1.1, because it is Department 1, Inventory and Logistics, and SOP 1, Creating Shipping Plans, okay? So then each step, it's going to be numbered, step 1, step 2, step 3. So then you're going to have like SOP, whenever you have to call that step and, you know, for example, tell your VA or your team member, or maybe there is a mistake or something to improve in this one step, you can call it like with a real number, like, oh, go check step 1.1.3. Okay. <laughs> so that's a way, you know, you can really refer to each step of your process so that you can improve it actually, instead of saying, oh, look, that step you know where you do this and that and do this and this and that so it's gonna be hard to actually name that and you know to close this process of creating <laughs> processes you know the last piece of advice i can give is to create an sop database okay so when you have people responsible for each sop then you have numbered those sops then you put everything into a spreadsheet which is going to be like your database where you're going to put the links and all the relevant information of each SOP so that, you know, at one glance, you will have the whole list of your SOPs. They will be very easy to find at that point. I love that advice. I mean, I'm listening to this and going, gosh, there's so many ways that we could improve our process and uh, go a bit more granular. I thought that was really cool what you said. It's like go to step this with, you know, really, really breaking it down so somebody knows where to go in the SOP versus saying, here's the SOP, find it, you know, that's where stuff breaks. So really fantastic advice. Now, you know, you've been around FBA and in e-commerce and things like that for a while. I'm curious if you were able to look ahead, do you have any idea of say, you know, insights or emerging trends within the FBA industry and you know, an idea of where the industry is heading? Yeah, sure. So, you know, what everybody's seeing is that, you know, mergers and acquisitions in the M&A industry, it's growing a lot in the Amazon space, you know, coming up with lots of aggregators are coming and acquiring brands. You know, what that means for the smaller sellers is that, you know, competition obviously is going to increase, but also now the name of the game is going to be like operational efficiency, or operational excellence, okay? Because all these big companies, they do have very complex and accurate and powerful <laughs> SOPs and smart people implementing them. So in order to really have a chance to compete in this market, which is still, you know, a very attractive one because it just keeps growing and I can see growth for the next 20 years. Okay. So it's just becoming more like a real business, you know, like five years ago or more, there were a lot of people doing Amazon as a side business or they were just shipping products to FBA and they were selling. But now, you know, it became more complex. There is also more opportunity because there is just much more dollars, you know, going through Amazon, every other marketplace and 
e-commerce in general. So the opportunity is great, but you need to really step up your game and really focus on operational excellence. And uh, SOPs and systems is the main part of doing that. So in the future, people will need to, I think, more and more understand SOPs and implement them in their business in order to create this operational excellence. And, you know, as the industry evolves, I think Uh, Companies will have more the need of external help because things are getting more complex. You really need to be great at what you're doing because, you know, the founder or the entrepreneurs cannot be great at everything. You know, we will need to hire a team, you know, with experts that spend most of their past working life into getting specialized on something. So you need to get help by like a very specialized PPC manager. You'll need the help of logistics manager or a sourcing manager because uh, you really want to have, you know, the best people doing each of those functions. Okay. And then I think it's going to go like multi-channel. I can see that Being in China for several years, I've seen that the Western world, it's kind of catching up with China because the e-commerce industry in China, it's like 10 years ahead of the Western world, really. Like they have uh, e-commerce adoption of over like 40% in terms of total retail sales, while in the US, I guess now it's about 15% or something. So Chinese people are buying, are much more into e-commerce than anybody else in the world. And I can see there that, you know, multi-channel is the main trend since the past five years. And that's, I think, where it's going to go. So in the US or in the Western world. So I don't think Amazon will be anymore the main channel. I think, you know, sellers in the future will focus their strategy on multi-channel strategy. Like everybody will have Amazon, Walmart, Shopify, and so on. So that's to add, you know, to the complexity of everything, but that's where I think it's going to go. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear your perspective on that as somebody who had spent so many years in China to come on and say, actually, they're a lot further ahead than we are. I haven't heard that perspective before, and I think it's relevant. You know, we think that we are a lot further ahead in the West, but as you said, like our adoption rate is a lot lower and they've already finessed the system. I know that you were saying that in order to stay ahead, you know, it's all about those operational efficiencies and you've really got to up your game. It kind of leads me to my next subject because I know that you feel passionately about those subjects and that you wanted to help sellers. So you started your own podcast called the Seller Process Podcast. Talk to me about the motivation behind the show. Was it that you saw a need in the community to really address some of those subjects? Yeah, I think, you know, it was really something that came up naturally because of at this point in time, you know, as I mentioned just now, you know, with all these aggregators coming up, there is more and more the need of operational efficiency and operational excellence. So I think it's a very current topic and I can see, you know, that people are not really familiar with this topic and because I feel like passionate about sharing this knowledge with people. So that's why I started this podcast in order to share what I think are, you know, some of the most important business fundamentals, okay? Because, you know, all these courses and YouTube videos, people talk about tactics, okay? So like actionable things that, you know, in order to increase your like PPC performance or let's say, yeah, increase conversion, whatever it is, or your keyword ranking. But nobody's talking about is the fundamentals of business. In the end, you're running a business like a fashion store or a restaurant. It is a business like any other business. What I think entrepreneurs are lacking, the business fundamentals, concept around, you know, creating systems and processes to really make sure that, you know, the company produces outcomes that are predictable. So that's the main motivation behind that. Yeah, I think that's an excellent perspective. We talked about it some in the podcast. People bypass some of the most fundamental or simplest advice for something more complex. And it's like, you can't just zoom past those things. Like you really got to start from square one. I know that you are doing a lot to educate people and put resources together for them. Speaking of resources that you've generously included an ebook for our listeners, and we will include it in this episode's show notes. Could you give some context about what the ebook is about? 
Sure, yeah. So basically, you know, it touches a lot of the point that we discussed today and it goes deeper into the structure of the SOP. I share some examples of how they should look like. I give of my recommendations on what I think is the best way to create these SOPs. I give some tips and tricks on how they can do it effortlessly. And yeah, so it just goes deeper into what we spoke about today and adds even more ideas for you to start implementing this. And also I share links and uh, templates, some of the templates like the one that I spoke about before, the SOP database, you can find that as well. So there are different templates that are ready to use that they can download inside the ebook in order to you know make their life easier. Mm. Templates. No, I'm thinking like, gosh, I mean, I'm excited for that. I would love to download some and start implementing them on our team because, you know, we have our own database of SOPs, but we are kind of going from scratch or coming up with them as we go along. And that's probably not the best system. So I'm just thinking specifically in my team. So very, very cool that you have that resource for everybody Geomarka, it's been a lot of fun having you on and going through some of these things. I'm feeling inspired to get a little bit more organized and efficient now. We like to close up these episodes with just a couple rapid fire questions. If you're cool with that, I can kick it off. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Awesome. Okay. So sometimes these are a little bit harder than they seem. They're deep, but we're meant to do like shorter answers. So what's your ultimate productivity or efficiency hack for e-commerce sellers? Well, it is time tracking and task tracking because this is a rapid fire question. We'll not go deeper into this, but you can find you know more information about time tracking by reading the book Clockwork by Mike Alowitz. And also I have interviewed Adrian Dorson, which is the co-author of this method, let's say, called the Run Like Clockwork. They use time tracking to increase their efficiency and productivity. You will find an interview also in my podcast about time tracking. Time tracking. Yeah, that's a great one. All right. Well, what about tools or resources for Amazon sellers to create effective SOPs? Well, as I said, it's very simple. You should not overcomplicate this. I use personally like Google Docs or spreadsheets, you know, Excel files or, you know, the whole software that Google give you and screen recorders. You can choose any like Loom or Screen Customatic. And then you need to have a cloud storage like Google Drive or Dropbox. That's it. You know, you don't really need any crazy tool to do that. Or even you can use even Canva to create flowcharts. But that's it. You know, keep it simple. Awesome. And finally, what has been your funniest moment while in this journey to create and implement SOPs? Well, it's more about, you know, the satisfaction of seeing your work giving its fruits. So for example, you know, I've got, you know, frustrated into like, I couldn't really make one of my teammates create like a very good inventory check report. And then after lots of feedback, you know, one day, you know, I wake up and then, he sent me like a great inventory check report, you know, with all the recommendation of the products that we should order more or send uh, inventory from our 3PL. So that was, you know, it's not really what you call a fun moment, but it was, I laughed by myself because I said, oh my gosh, finally, it was great. It was a great satisfaction of seeing your SOPs and systems producing the outcome that you wished them to produce. I love that. It's a nice aha moment, as you were saying. So it's very cool. Jay Marco, thank you again. I think this has been such a useful podcast episode. Um, You've given actual advice and even better, you've given us an ebook to share so people can implement this stuff and come back with us and see what they've improved with your advice. So thank you so much for offering that for our audience today. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah, for having me here. Yeah. It's been awesome having you on. Thank you. everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've walked away with a bit of new insight that'll help you in your digital entrepreneurship journey. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To learn more about businesses available for sale at Empire Flippers, click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.